this is the title. Can 70 really be the new 50? I, uh, living longer and healthier with exercise. At the end of this talk, we hope that you will be able to understand why exercise is indeed medicine. The physical activity goals for adults in the United States based on the 2018 guidelines and what your own activity level is using the physical activity vital sign and why this is even more important during the COVID pandemic. Hopefully you'll be able to understand the training and expertise of a primary care sports medicine physician, which is what I am, and the concept of the shared decision-making model. So before we start, I'm gonna start with a little video. Finally here tonight, who ever heard of a runner setting world records just a couple of years after taking up the sport? It turns out this beginner has plenty of life experience. At 103 years old, Julia Hawkins isn't slowing down. She's picking up the pace. Julia Hawkins, gold medalist. During this week's National Senior Games in Albuquerque, New Mexico, Hurricane Hawkins, as she's known, won gold in both the 50 and 100 meter races. That's not all. The sprinter set a new USA track and field record as the oldest woman to compete on an American track. I hope I'm inspiring them to be healthy and they realize you can still be doing it at this kind of an age. Hawkins is no stranger to breaking records. She started her running career at age 100 and quickly racked up three world records by 102, including in the 100 meter dash. She told reporters at the time she skipped her nap to make that race. I thought it'd be neat to run at 100 and uh, do the 100 yard dash. Her training secret, gardening at her home in Louisiana. Hawkins says she competes to impress her family, but with this drive and a few world records under her belt, she's on track to impress many more people than that. So Hurricane Hawkins, as she said, she does it to be healthy. So um, our lifespan is indeed was increasing. Uh, you see this little blip in 2014 and that's when the opioid epidemic hit a bit. Um, and then this drop here uh, of the United States as well as um, other countries that are comparable is because of COVID. Uh, but the lifespan um, prior to COVID um, was around uh, 78, shortly, uh, actually 79. Um, was what the lifespan was. If you look at the lifespan um, here in 2019, um, we are down at the bottom of similar uh, country, comparable country averages, but um, for men, 76.3 years of age and women, 81.4 years of age. Um, I especially like this figure that says that at birth, this is our expected age of women at birth. Um, for the United States, it's 81.4. And again, for the men, it's 76.3. If we've made it age 40, then there's another 42.7 years to live. If we've made it to the age 80, then 89.8 years um, total uh, of age. For men, if they've made it to age 80, there's 8.4 years. So certainly if you've demonstrated longevity uh, at this age, then you're gonna beat uh, the average for the United States. Uh, this was me in 1980, 81. Uh, it was my senior year of high school and I played three sports um, in, my, uh, in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, this is now 40 years later. Um, and this is what I am uh, continuing to do. So I can't play uh, hard court anymore, but I can play on the sand. This is actually my daughter's boyfriend, uh, me, my husband. <laughs> and my son, <laughs> and I'm just laughing because I laugh every time I watch this video. My daughter is actually one videotaping it. Um, but this is what I can do now because I can't play hard court because of my knee. Uh, I have, uh, like many other people during pandemic, picked up golf. There we go, that's better. That's better because my first one was a big, big shank, I believe. And uh, I can no longer run or jog, um, but I am, able to still continue to hike. So I've altered what I can do now 40 years later um, because of circumstances. I want to um, show this picture to you. I, for the first time since COVID went home and uh, the summer, past summer for my mom's 92nd birthday because I was uh, West Coast, I, I uh, slept in 
a bit compared to her. I got up and here she was doing her exercises. She's 92 and this is uh, her routine that she does. Uh, she'd injured her back uh, 25 years prior and um, she had learned some of these back exercises to do and she continued to do it um, to maintain her uh, core strength. This uh, is, uh, she, I brought her back to the Bay Area with me then um, to spend some time with me. Um, my dad had recently deceased a couple years prior. Uh, I bought her a new pair of shoes and I said, mom, walk around and see how they feel comfortable. And this is a woman that loves to dance. And so um, she began to dance, uh, trying on the shoes. And there was music in the shoe store. There wasn't any, it wasn't just in her head. Um, I adore my mother. I then, we drove down to LA to visit some family members. Um, this was on the way down to um, one of the Southern California beaches. And um, she got her feet in the Pacific Ocean, which is what she wanted to do. Um, she thought this would probably be her last trip to um, California. Uh, then she took a nap, as we know how important sleep is. And then she made it all the way up the stairs as well. So um, yes, I um, have benefited from genetics. Uh, my grandmother lived to be 100, my mother's 92, um, and our genetics can determine our behavior, not only genetics in terms of um, how we are physically, but also our behavior, our personality traits, um, whether or not we like to be active, for example, our abilities, they're in our nature. And then there's nurture, the environment, what our upbringing is, our life experiences. Um, we are nurtured to behave in certain ways. So if we see our parents or, or uh, people around us, our, our role models, um, being active and exercising, then that can nurture us to behave in certain ways. But regardless of, of which it is more of nature versus nurture, it shouldn't be a debate, but it should be where we utilize both of these to help us understand and help us become uh, creatures who uh, enjoy having our bodies move. So definitions, physical activity is any body movement that results in energy expenditure. And that could be exercise. That could be activities of daily living, like gardening, like a hurricane, um, the runner, she basically, Hurricane Hawkins, she gardening is what kept her active and, and ready to run uh, in the races. And active transportation, for example, cycling um, to get to work or cycling to get to school. Exercise, on the other hand, is physical activity that is planned, structured, repetitive, with the objective to improve or maintain physical fitness. And physical activity can certainly be equivalent of exercise. And sometimes it can be both in this cartoon. Uh, basically, we all uh, know Christmas is, or the holidays are coming, whether or not there's gifts associated with it. Oftentimes by February or March, we may uh, find that the uh, uh, exercise equipment is no longer being used, but um, you can start to dust that exercise equipment and that can be the same as exercise as you get that treadmill ready to go again. So we know about the benefits of physical activity. Research has shown, um, and for example, in our youth, we know that there are improvements. If they're active, there's improvements in their cognition. Their memories improve, their behaviors improved in school. Um, bone health is improved. Uh, fitness levels, and in fact, uh, risk factors of the risk of developing heart disease, of developing um, um, diabetes is also uh, decreased. If you start the physical activity as youth, heart health, um, we already talked about fitness, sleep quality is improved uh, with physical activity. There's also clearly a decreased risk of depression, and anxiety in our youth, as well as a decreased risk of excessive weight gain. So, but let's talk about adults. Much more has been researched in adults. And so physical activity will reduce the risk of dementia. All cause mortality, that's everything all causes mortality, and then specifically heart disease, stroke, high blood pressure, type two diabetes, depression, falls, especially in adults 65 and older, and postpartum depression, those who have had babies um, given birth, uh, it reduces the risk of postpartum depression and the risk of excessive weight gain. It also will improve bone health with the loading. It'll improve bone health. It'll improve physical function, which therefore improves quality of life and the ability to maintain a healthy body weight. And look at this factor, it prevents eight types of cancer, bladder, breast, colon, and emetrial, esophagus, kidney, stomach, and lung. There have been multiple programs that have been designed um, over the decades 
um, to try to help us to be more physically active. And in 2012, when I went to the White House, this was Michelle Obama's um, initiative, Let's Move. Uh, it was her um, uh, program to raise a healthier generation of kids. And this included not only uh, movement and physical activity, but also healthy foods. But believe it or not, um, the first physical activity guidelines ever to be published by the federal government wasn't until 2008. And it was the physical activity guidelines and they had them for children and adolescents, that's greater than six, as well as for adults uh, greater than 18. And it was uh, sponsored by the CDC, as well as the Department of Health and Human Services. And their phrase was, be active and play 60 minutes every day. And that truly is what they recommended for children and adult and adolescents. 10 years later, it changed. And there was a need in 2018 to change it uh, to a different type of initiative. And this time, uh, the CDC was no, it was no longer under the CDC umbrella, but under the Office of Disease Prevention and Health uh, Promotion, continued under HHS and is the physical activity guidelines, except it was move your way. Now, these are the guidelines for children and adolescents. And I'm going over this quickly, primarily because some of you may have children and may have grandchildren, but um, essentially these are some of the activities that they say, if they're, um, they need 60 minutes of activity every day, it should be moderate to intense, moderate intensity aerobic activity, anything that gets their heart beating faster, and at three days a week at least, encourage them to step it up to vigorous intensity aerobic activity. So, and they define it as breathing fast and their heart is pounding. As part of their daily 60 minutes of activity, within that there needs to be included muscle strengthening activity three times a week. And here's examples of monkey bars. Now our pediatric orthopedic colleagues are, uh, this is probably some of the number one uh, injury of orthopedic bone injuries is swinging on the monkey bars, uh, push-ups you can see here, uh, hanging on rings, uh, and then bone strengthening activity is bones need pressure to get stronger, um, just like they do for adults. So they give examples of jumping rope, running, and other types of weight bearing activities. So when we go to the adults who are ages 18 to 64, very similar. Uh, they need a mix, we need a mix of physical activity to stay healthy. So again, moderate intensity, um, aerobic activity, anything that gets a heart beating faster, at least 150 minutes a week. Okay, that would be 30 minutes, for example, five times a week. And then part of that would be muscle strengthening activity at least two days a week. Um, and that would be part of it. And certainly, if people instead wanted to do vigorous intensity, like running, then you should be aiming for at least 75 minutes a week. Um, and if that's more, you know, what they encourage you to do is if you can't put together 30 minutes, well, then five minutes is better than 30 minutes, is better than zero minutes. 10 minutes is better than zero minutes. So at least do something, um, if, even if it can't be 30 minutes. So here's some example of moderate intensity activities, because it hasn't been well defined uh, on those charts. But walking briskly is a moderate intensity, recreational swimming cycling slower than 10 miles per hour on a level terrain, tennis, which is doubles tennis, active yoga, like vinyasa or power yoga, ballroom or line dancing, general yard work, home repair work, and exercise classes like water aerobics. What about vigorous intensity? This is where you start to get your heart rate going faster, jogging or running, swimming laps, singles tennis, vigorous dancing, bicycling faster than 10 miles per hour, jumping rope, heavy yard work, where you're digging or shoveling, hiking up a hill, heavy backpack, and then this high intensity interval training or HIT training, and then exercise classes like step aerobics or kickboxing. Now, you guys know as well as I do that some people play singles uh, really vigorously and some people can play singles pretty moderate uh, intensity. The same thing with um, step aerobics, you know, it says vigorous step aerobics, but certainly people can do step aerobics at their own pace. So how is a better way to estimate intensity? If, you know, if you're not wearing a heart rate monitor, uh, if, you're not, um, if you don't have a speedometer so you know how fast your bike is going, we oftentimes use the talk test, right? So if you have a low intensity activity, you can talk and sing easily. Moderate intensity, you can talk, but you can't sing. And if you're doing vigorous activity, you can only say a few words before you pause for breath. 
Um, sometimes you, you may have heard of this rating of perceived exertion, RPE. Uh, we'll use that sometimes when we're giving people stress treadmills. And then if you're measuring your heart rate and you can calculate your maximum heart rate and you're wearing um, a heart rate monitor, you can calculate your intensity of exercise that way too. But this is probably the easiest to do. And a good rule of thumb is for adults, two minutes of moderate intensity of act exercise is equivalent to one minute of vigorous intensity exercise. How about if you're older uh, than 64, 65 years of age? So if you're older, the recommendation is the same as with adults greater than 18. You still want at least 150 minutes a week and included in that two days a week of muscle strengthening activity. Remember, this is evidence-based um, in terms of what uh, is felt will keep you um, um, with enough, enough activity to get all the benefits of exercise. And again, it says here, tight on time, start with just five minutes. It will all add up. And that is totally true. But one of the things I recommend for adults who are elderly, older, is to do a multi-component physical activity. And what does that mean? It includes not only the aerobic and muscle strengthening activities, but also balance training. The other thing is when you're older, you want to determine your level of effort for the physical activity relative to the current level of fitness. And if you have chronic conditions, it's important that you understand, maybe with the help of your primary care physician or your sports medicine physician, whether and how conditions can affect your ability to do regular physical activity safely. And again, if you cannot do 150 minutes of moderate intense aerobic activity a week because of chronic conditions, then be as physically active as the abilities and conditions allow. So what is multi-component physical activity? So this is physical activity, which is very important to prove your physical function and decrease the risk of falling. Um, these are activities that can be done at home or in a structured group type of setting. And it effectively will combine balance with aerobic and muscle strengthening. So you can see this is ballroom dancing. So you're combining aerobic with balance with the ballroom dancing. This is Tai Chi, which is balance as well as some muscle strengthening. Uh, yoga, similarly, uh, muscle strengthening and balance. And then walking, uh, even on a slightly uneven terrain with a slight elevation is working on your balance and your aerobic uh, exercise. These are all examples of multi-component physical activities. And why is this important? Studies have shown that there is a dose-dependent relationship, a strong relationship among moderate to vis vigorous physical activity, sitting time, and the risk of all-cause mortality in adults. So what does that mean? If you are able to exercise 150 minutes um, a week, there is a 33%, one-third decreased lower risk of all causes mortality. So here's someone who's totally sedentary, watching TV, playing video games, um, their job maybe is at a desk, eight to 12 hours. Um, the more that you have this daily sitting time, then the increased mortality you're gonna have and your more risk of all cause mortality will decrease the closer you move from red to green. So on this X, Y axis, the more active that you are, the more you're moving towards green. Daily sitting time, the more you decrease your daily sitting time, the more you're moving out of that red, more towards a green hue. If you wanna look at it in a graphical fashion like this, um, you're able to look at, for example, here, your physical activity, if you have zero met hours per week where you're sitting all the time, your hazard ratio uh, of mortality is at one. And as you exercise more and you incorporate more minutes of physical, moderate physical activity, um, as measured in, again, um, met hours, and we'll discuss that a little bit later, then you start to get the benefit from exercise. And there is no evidence of increased risk at the high end as well, which is important. So how do you know about your exercise? This is very easy, right? We talk about the fifth vital sign is taking a fiscal activity vital sign. The first question would be, on average, how many days a week do you engage in moderate or greater fiscal activity? Question number two would be on those days, how many minutes do you engage in activity at this level? And you multiply one times two to get your average minutes per week. And remember we said 
um, recommendations are 150 minutes per week. So clearly, for example, if you exercise five days a week and each day is the average of 30 minutes, you're gonna be getting your 150 minutes per week of moderate or greater physical activity. So, so far, everything you've seen has been moderate, moderate to intense physical activity. Here we are in uh, 2019, I believe this is where this data is from. These are the percentage of adults in each state who are able to achieve at least 150 minutes of that moderate intensity physical activity or 75 minutes of vigorous intensity and the muscle strengthening activities two or more times days a week. If we start with our state of California, um, or my state, some of you may be calling from other states, but here, this tells you that in our state, only 20.9 to 23.3% of adults are achieving this standard. 150 minutes per week of moderate uh, or 75 of vigorous and muscle strengthening two or more days a week. What are some of the better states are the ones that are in blue. Um, say outdoorsy uh, or snow, you know, cross country, et cetera. Um, and then there's some where there's data that's unavailable, but look at the lower levels, less than 20.8% are some of these beige states that we're seeing. So we wonder why, why aren't more people being physically active? So what factors do you think would be positively associated with adult physical activity? Just think to yourself, what do you think are positively associated factors, um, which means that adults are gonna be physically active? Some of those would be pretty easy. Um, if you look at it, it could be surprising too as well. Those with this post-secondary education, higher income, who enjoy exercise, makes sense who have an expectation of the benefits. They're aware of what the benefits of exercise are. They believe in self-efficacy. They believe in their own ability to be able to exercise. There's a history of activity in adulthood. You know, we've always talked about also, if you were active as a child, but that doesn't seem to, uh, to, 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 to come out in some of this data. But if you've been active an adult, that's a positive factor. Social support from peers, family, or your partner, access to and satisfaction with facilities. That's been a big deal during COVID, right? Uh, adult physical activity, but having access to and enjoying those facilities is a positive factor. Enjoyable scenery and safe neighborhoods. Conversely then, what factors would you feel are negatively associated with adult physical activity? And here are the factors are older age, a low income, lack of time, low motivation, living in a rural, a set rural setting, perception that there's a great effort needed for exercise, overweight or obesity, perception that they're in poor health and having a disability. So which of these can we change uh, so that we can begin having more adults be physically active? Well, here's one, you know, we go back, one of the things, if we look back, back at this, perception that there's a great effort needed for exercise. Wow, exercise, right? We talked about exercise is routine and it's, it's something that you, you do for a purpose versus um, physical activity is everything that you do. You know, you get out of the car, you walk to the store or you walk to the store um, or you ride your bike to work um, or you garden, that's um, activities of daily living, that's physical activity. But what about this? So the 2018 Physical Activity Scientific Report found that if you replace sedentary behavior, like the sitting, with even light intensity physical activity, that will reduce the risk of mortality, cardiovascular disease, and type 2 diabetes. So the new philosophy has been, let's avoid the sedentary behavior. You know, now this has come about because of these wearable devices. And so you can see this picture, this is one of the um, Apple watches, where it tells you to stand. Every 30 minutes, it'll tell you to stand and move around for at least one minute. There's increased body of evidence that shows the health benefits like we talked about of even light intensity physical activity. And there's some evidence that light intensity physical activity is a gateway for people to then move on up to start to perform moderate intensity physical activity. So is walking going to be the exercise prescription in the future? 
And we know that a lot of people track their walking with wearable devices. Some of the modifiers to walking is you can change the step count, um, the cadence of 100 steps per minute. I have a metronome here on my phone. That's 100 steps per minute. That is equivalent of three METs or metabolic equivalents. Now, metabolic equipment, equivalent is the ratio of the working metabolic rate divided by the resting metabolic rate. So one MET is the energy expenditure when resting or sitting still, right? That makes sense. So three METs is three times that, that energy when you're sitting still. And that represents more of a moderate intensity where you're walking three miles per uh, hour, for example. So a MET describes the intensity of an exercise or activity. The time of day is also a modifier. You know, whether or not you're walking in the morning, when you're already tired, maybe in the morning, or if you're a morning person, walking in the morning is best for you versus at the end of the day after work, you could be tired or by the end of the day, you're energized to be home. And so that is a modifier in terms of how your intensity of walking will be. And it's clear that walking does have a positive impact on decreasing cardiovascular disease risk factors. So then the question is, does the volume of walking or the intensity of walking or both decrease mortality? Which one is it? So this is a great study that was done where uh, almost 5,000 adults wore accelerometers for a mean of 5.7 days per week and a mean of 14.4 hours per day, okay? So they had it on for the majority of the day um, and then for the majority of days out of the week. Their mean steps per day was 9,124, so slightly above 9,000. And these adults were followed for 10 years. And what these researchers found that the walking volume was associated with a lower risk of mortality for US adults, not the cadence, but the walking volume. So if you look at this graph, you're looking at about at about 1,000, 10,000 steps per day is when this mortality rate levels out. You're not gonna get any more benefits um, much past 10,000 steps per day. So most of you've heard about this 10,000 steps and you've heard of people that have been stayed up and haven't gone to bed yet because they wanna get enough walking in around the house to get their 10,000 steps. Now the World Health Organization, you've heard a lot of it with COVID. Um, they came out uh, much more recently um, and talked about the fact, I love this term, habitual physical activity. Physical activity has to become a habit. And they deem that habitual physical activity is essential to prevent in the prevention of non-communicable disease. So we're talking heart disease, diabetes, metabolic diseases. Uh, we are globally confronted with a physical inactivity pandemic. And much like our percentages of uh, adults who are physically inactive, who are not meeting their 150 minutes a week, other countries in the world are similarly uh, dropping in terms of their physical inactivity. Um, the, the aim of the WHO is to reduce global physical inactivity levels by 15% by 2030. And they had a recent update to their physical activity guidelines, which did represent a shift in the way we think about physical activity, not just 30 minutes a day, but what is happening the entire 24 hour day um, and how can we look at this physical activity much more holistically? So they put together and, and what I think their differences uh, in terms of, of their um, diagrams that they put together um, is that they've categorized it into adults and older adults, but they really have made it clear that we have to limit the amount of time that we spend being sedentary and we do have to replace it with more physical activity of any intensity, including light intensity. So for adults, very similar, 150, they have to 300 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic physical activity throughout the week, all right? Or 75 to 150 of vigorous intensity. So the World Health Organization has actually, uh, expectations are a bit higher. Um, they also still continue with the muscle strengthening activities. 
For the older adults, it's the same numbers like we had before. Again, uh, the diagrams are a little bit different reflecting the older adults, um, but still limiting sedentary time. And then this concept of the very multi-component physical activity three days a week to add on to this muscle strengthening activities, okay? And there's someone practicing squatting and Tai Chi and then doing some lifting uh, uh, dumbbells. When we get to adults and the older adults with chronic conditions hasn't changed in terms of the expectation of the modern intensity versus physical intensity, still limiting the amount of time being stationary and replacing it with a higher intensity activity. And again, two days a week of muscle strengthening activities, three days of very multi-component physical activity. And then we get to the adults that are living with disabilities of which we have many. And with those adults, same amount of duration, you wanna limit sedentary and it's still two days and three days. So it's really quite the same, except these little diagrams are different because of the ages or the disabled um, uh, the disabilities uh, that the uh, adults may have. So how do we define a dose of exercise? What is a dose of exercise? Similar to a dose of medication, uh, you have to define it, right? So um, I like the FIT principle where you're looking at frequency of exercise, how many times a week, for example, the intensity of exercise. Remember we talked about, uh, you know, kind of the, the talking test is a one way to look at it. Time, amount of time that you're doing that exercise, and then the type of exercise. And there are four types of exercise that we've been discussing, your aerobic or cardiovascular, strength, flexibility, and balance. So when you're prescribing exercise and recommending exercise, and you're starting someone off with exercise, there are four factors here, frequency, intensity, time, and type. And you don't ever want to change more than one variable at a time as you're increasing someone's uh, exercise load. And that's important. So for example, you don't want to, if you're starting off three times a week, that's frequency, and you're having them do low intensity walking, right? And you're starting them off at 15 minutes, three times a week, and you've picked the walking. That's the type. Let's say that they have done that uh, over the course of two weeks. On that third week, you don't want to increase them to five times a week, increase the time to 25 minutes. That's increasing two of those variables. You don't want to do that. You only want to increase one of those variables as you increase the dosage of exercise. Okay, so how can I walk? All right, Dr. Chang, you've been telling us that exercise is good for us and I'm not used to exercising very much. Okay, I would like to start walking. seems like I can do that. It's low intensity, but boy, daylight savings time has happened. I can't get up in the morning. I, you know, I've got too much things. I've got to, got to get, you know, get things ready for work. By the time I get home, it's cold and it's getting too dark, right? I can't walk. So what's our solution to that? Well, here's one solution that you could try. You could try an indoor walking plan, 20 minutes a day, um, or you could break it up in the five minutes in four segments. So for example, if you don't have 20 minutes that you wanna do, because once you get home, you have got to, for example, you've got to start cooking, all right? Then what you could do is you could say to yourself, okay, I've got five minutes that I could walk around the house for five minutes. Uh, before breakfast, before I leave for work, and um, before I come back to work or before lunch, I can walk for five minutes. How about before dinner, I can walk for five minutes, and then, you know, after dinner, I can walk for another five minutes. That you can get that 20 minutes in, something like that. You can also break up the monotony. So, basic uh, walking indoors around uh, your house, um, thinking about how you're going to walk from the kitchen to, for example, the bedroom, et cetera. Um, and you can do that. And then the next time you walk the next day, you can do something where you're doing some interval training where you're gonna walk a minute at a moderate pace around the house, and then you're gonna stop. And then for one minute, you're gonna march quickly in place for a minute. And so you're gonna have that increase in heart rate and then back down to a moderate pace. And then again, a minute later, increasing to that fast heart rate. Um, another thing you can do then is you can also um, on day three, 
do that same type of interval training as we discussed in, in B, but then after two minutes, a minute of a, a moderate pace walk, a minute of a fast march, then you do some body weight exercises. You can do some squats. You can do some modified push-ups. You know, if you can't do push-ups on the ground, maybe you can do it against a table, a modified push-up, and then you can do calf raises. Um, and that could be something that you can do uh, with, this is a body weight strength exercises, um, and integrate that in with that walking plan. And it is easy to do, you're doing it at home. Um, and again, 20 minutes a day, which is better than nothing, zero a day. Uh, what about this? You know, Dr. Chang, this is great, but you know what? I already have osteoarthritis. And what if my knee hurts to even walk for short distances? What do I do? Well, we do know about weight management for osteoarthritis. And we do know that for every one pound of weight loss, there is an equivalent of four to six pounds of a decrease in force on that knee per step. So if you're able to lose a pound um, every two weeks, for example, um, in a month, your knee is not gonna see 10 pounds. And if you're able to continue that um, realistic weight loss program, um, pretty soon your knee is gonna start feeling more and more um, uh, happy uh, that it's not seeing quite as much load on it. Um, there's pain reduction has been shown with even minimal weight loss. Uh, and then we do know, and I want to make this clear, exercise alone without making substantial dietary changes is not as effective. And this is what oftentimes is happening uh, to us, right? We're noticing this. I'm noticing this more and more. Let's go ahead and stick a, an iPhone right there. This is a teenager looking down at the iPhone. And all of a sudden, you're going to this really great posture, sprinting and head down. Now you get this neck protruding forward, which is not good posture at all. And then what happens is uh, we have the tendency to gain weight uh, in the middle age years. Um, and then it makes us less active, less healthy. And then we enter into our senior years, um, not good posture, weaker, um, and certainly not as physically healthy as we could be. What do we know about arthritis as well um, is that PT exercise and strength training work. And, and almost everyone is going to have some weakness or functional limitations or imbalances that can be corrected. So, you know, I, I can imagine some of you are saying, well, I do Pilates, I do it three times a week, I'm pretty strong. Uh, but certainly there are times that things are missed. Um, so the most effective physical therapy interventions that we have are exercise and the types of exercise are aerobic, aquatic, strengthening and proprioception or balance. Um, you know, types of PT interventions that are done is that your strength is evaluated as well as your gait pattern. Uh, closed chain exercises are oftentimes initiated. That's again, where a squat, for example, is a closed chain exercise where your foot is against a solid, uh, the solid ground. Um, low to non-impact aerobic exercise uh, is very effective, and that could include biking, elliptical, swimming, and water rehab exercises. Um, PTs can also do joint capsule muscle stretches, uh, utilize modalities. Uh, and the most, you know, really effective that has to be done is daily home exercise and a rehab self-management program. So this was a great uh, study that was done in 2020. And it looked at 156 patients and it uh, enrolled them in either a physical therapy arm where they had everyone do physical therapy. And the people in that group had a mean of almost 12 visits per patient over one year, okay? And then half of them were enrolled getting a steroid injection in their knee. And the mean was 2.6 injections per patient over one year, okay? Notice that the BMI was 31.5. And that is um, um, higher than we would like to be, but these are overweight, uh, obese uh, people, okay? Um, there were found to be more patients with more severe OA in the PT group as well. These were the exercises that were given, uh, the PT exercises that were given. So you can see they weren't 
arduous, really, uh, really well described, easy to do. Um, this is really just strengthening your, your knee. Um, this is knee extension all the way down. Uh, this exercise is knee flexion, um, either using your hands or using a towel. This is a essentially strengthening, uh, strengthening your hips and thighs by doing a double leg squat. You can see that this gentleman is hanging on to the chair for balance, so definitely should be done. Um, and then a single leg squat, again, hanging on to the chair for balance, making sure form is okay. This is using TheraBand, the stretchy tubing to go into a knee extension, okay? And this strengthens the hip, posterior hip especially. And then lastly, stretching the hamstring, stretching the calf, and stretching the quadriceps and hip flexor. So this study found that after a year, physical therapy was more effective in improving pain and reducing function compared to steroid injection in patients with knee OA. If they did regular physical activity, they had less pain, improved function, improved quality. It did not worsen the disease and it did not make the pain worse. So this was a great study that we say to our patients, let's try a course of physical therapy first. Because if we give you a steroid injection, it may help with your pain, but if you do not correct your strength, your flexibility, your balance, that pain will return. The other study that I wanted to tell you about was really looking at, we talked about this 150 minutes a week. And this is one of the things that makes people say, I can't do it. It's too much. I can't commit to it. Right. And then we start to say, well, wait a second. Okay. Well, you know, just, if you can only do 10 minutes, if you can only do five minutes, but certainly affects, you know, we would love people to try to attain uh, this goal of 150 minutes uh, a week of moderate activity or 75 of vigorous. But this study was an observational study and it looked at over 1,500 people, and they were wearing accelerometers again, ages 45 to 80. And what they found were those who had at least one hour of moderate to vigorous activity per week, one hour, um, for those who had pain or stiffness due, due to OA of the low extremity, but no disability, meaning they did not report that they were disabled with a slow, slow walking speed, or they were limited in their daily activities, but if they were able to do one hour of moderate to vigorous activity per week, it significantly increased the likelihood that they would maintain disability-free status over the next four years. Meaning over the next four years, they wouldn't be afflicted with a slower than normal walking speed and they would not be limited in their daily activities. So this new minimum threshold, at least an hour per week is definitely more achievable in our patients. And it's also more, more reinforcing. And if there's a little bit of success introduced, that will make people more confident to take that next step to turn that one hour of moderate to vigorous activity per week to more like two hours or 120 minutes, right? So that's what we wanna do. And we can tell our patients, it does work. Here's another question. But should I start an exercise program during a pandemic? I mean, I don't want to get too tired and this COVID's still around. Well, let me show you why you should. Do you remember this, the physical activity vital sign? Well, this was um, proposed by one of my colleagues uh, and friends, Bob Salas. And he was the president of the American College of Sports Medicine. Uh, he's a sports medicine physician. And um, this exercise in medicine is what he proposed because we wanted people to know that exercise was just as helpful as taking an antihypertensive, uh, just as helpful as taking other medications. And we wanted to encourage people to just look at exercise as a topic prescription. So you recognize this, right? How many days per week do you engage in moderate to vigorous physical activity? How many minutes do you engage in physical activity at this level, right? That multiplication, easy to do. Well, what um, Dr. Salas did, and he worked, works for Kaiser, is they have a huge healthcare system and they were able to implement this physical activity vital sign into their patients' electronic health records. So they had almost 50,000 adult patients with a COVID-19 diagnosis from January, 2020 to October, 2020, okay? 10 month time period. And in these 48,000 adult patients, 
they had had at least three exercise vital sign measurements that had been recorded in the two years preceding their COVID-19 diagnosis, okay? What did they find? Did physical activity reduce the risk for severe outcomes? So again, out of these 48,440 adult patients, they looked at whether or not they were consistently inactive, which was zero to 10 minutes per week, some activity, or consistently meeting the guidelines. Those are the three categories. And each patient's self-reported physical activity category was then linked to the risk of hospitalization after COVID diagnosis, ICU admission, intensive care unit admission, and death. And patients with COVID-19 who were consistently inactive, zero to 10 minutes a week, during the two years preceding the pandemic were more likely to be hospitalized, admitted to the ICU and die than those consistently meeting physical activity guidelines. I'm gonna show you that again. Those patients who are diagnosed with COVID-19 who only exercise zero to 10 minutes per week during the two years preceding their illness with COVID-19 were more likely to be hospitalized more likely to be admitted to the ICU and more likely to die than those who were consistently meeting the guidelines. And being consistently inactive was a stronger risk factor for severe disease and outcomes than any of the other underlying medical conditions and risk factors they looked at, the CDC looked at, for example, asthma, heart disease, okay? The other ones that stood out as strong risk factors were age, so the older the age, whether or not they're pregnant, and a history of organ transplant. Even those that were doing some physical activity, that in-between category, right? 10 minutes to 149 minutes per week, had lower risk for severe COVID-19 outcomes, including death. Even some, right? Physical activity, therefore, is a strong modifiable risk factor for severe COVID-19. But how do I know that it is safe for me to start to exercise? Okay, Dr. Chang, we've talked about all these things. Okay, I, I think I can do it. I think I'm ready to do it. I think I'm motivated to do it. But is it safe? Um, do I know my heart is safe enough to start to exercise? So there are pre-exercise screening questions that we have found that have a high probability that there may be a cardiac issue. So these history questions are, do you have exertional chest pain when you exercise, does your chest hurt? Do you feel dizzy or feel faint during exercise? Do you have heart palpitations or shortness, feel shortness of breath during exertion? Do you have difficulty breathing when you're lying on your back in bed, you know, ready to go to bed? Or do you wake up in the middle of the night feeling short of breath or difficulty breathing? Do you have any ankle swelling? And is there anything in your medical history or any injuries or, or musculoskeletal problems or any diseases that you that would possibly affect your exercise? You know, and then during the physical, what we would do is we would screen with a blood pressure, a heart rate, rhythm, and do a heart and lung exam, you know, listening for a heart murmur, listening for any abnormal heart rhythm, and listening for any lung findings. And of course, looking to make sure you don't have any extremity injuries, ankle swelling, et cetera. Whether or not you should get an exercise test really is dependent uh, on, on, what, uh, on some of these guidelines. These are two uh, national organizations, the United States Preventive Services Task Force and the American Heart Association. And they've deemed that if you are a low risk asymptomatic adult, there's really no value in doing an exercise EKG, for example. If you're high risk, there's still insufficient evidence for or against. So really that becomes a decision that you make with, with your uh, physician. But you would consider exercise testing if you have known or suspected coronary artery disease, plus or minus a history of diabetes, you should have a screening before beginning a vigorous exercise program, which a vigorous means greater than six uh, METs. If you have exertional palpitations or atypical type of chest pain. So how can I get started? Here we are talking about this and we talked about walking, which is easy enough, but what are some other things um, that you could possibly consider um, in terms of exercise? So um, 
these next series of slides, I have to give um, my partner, uh, Carla Center, uh, credit for this because um, she accumulated some of these things um, uh, that I thought were really great to use for this talk. Um, we have a sports rehab, our physical therapy department has a sports rehab website for free online video and handouts for some common sports injuries or hip pain or knee injuries um, that you may have or an ankle sprain. So you can go to this website and you can uh, get some good stretches and some strengthening from this website. Go for Life um, is a really good website put together by the NIH, which talks about um, exercise and physical activity. So the different types of exercise that we had mentioned, um, aerobic exercise, balance, strength, um, how, what's the best way you get started, right? Um, what are the benefits? So this would reiterate what I've talked about in terms of some of these real life benefits. Um, finding the right fitness clothes. This is actually a great category here. How do you stay motivated to exercise and how do you have fun? They do have a special, um, uh, some videos for, for those who are more elderly. Um, so for those, a sample workout for those who are older and these YouTube videos are easy to follow along with um, and uh, could be very, very um, helpful for you or for your loved ones. Um, Fitness Blender is a free um, uh, website. Uh, you can get videos off of it in terms of different types of um, exercises to do. Now, this is the high intensity exercise program that we talk about, uh, high intensity, the interval training. And um, I've had plenty of people get hurt from this because they weren't ready to start this type of program. Um, so you definitely want to make sure that you uh, have gotten up to the point to be able to do some of these uh, fitness programs. And this is actually a really good website that will talk a little bit more about your readiness to do these um, exercises. But you can do this in the privacy of your own home. You got to get the dog off of, off of your yoga mat first, but um, other than that. And then yoga, there's a lot of, uh, you know, Nike has yoga uh, channel now, but this is uh, yoga with Adrian. Um, and this is really, really gentle stretching to really uh, improve your flexibility. The American College of Sports Medicine, we talked about the exercises medicine, their initiative here, and you can find on their website, uh, certainly um, some handouts um, in terms of helping you with a checklist of what you can do to get started um, uh, with your exercise program. And, and some of it is really as simple as parking. And if you're going to need to drive to go to a store, don't park in the closest uh, spot uh, to the front door, but park in the further spot, um, walking to the mailbox, uh, doing more gardening, ranking, for example, things like that. Now, um, this here I am with um, my other primary care sports medicine partners, uh, Dr. Anthony Luke, Dr. Carlin Center, Dr. Kristen Leanfield, um, and myself. And uh, we are all members of the American Medical Society for Sports Medicine. And this is a website, uh, www.amssm.org. And here, if you're not local, you're not in the Bay Area, um, I see patients in the East Bay and Berkeley, as well as in San Francisco at the Orthopedic Institute. And I see pediatric uh, patients as well in Walnut Creek. Uh, Dr. Wingfield's uh, in Marin primarily, and Dr. Center and Dr. Luke are in um, San Francisco and Mission Bay. But if you happen to be on this um, mini medical series, thank you for joining again, and you're not close to us, you can go to this website and you can uh, put in um, the city that you're living in or a zip code, and you can find a sports medicine physician who is a member of the American Medical Society for Sports Medicine. On this website as well are some resources for uh, athletes, coaches, and parents, the sports med today on some common injuries and what you can do about it, et cetera. But in terms of focusing on, sometimes a source medicine physician may be exactly what you need to help you get started on that exercise program. So what is AMSSM and what is primary care sports medicine? So AMSSM is a multidisciplinary organization of over 4,500 members now dedicated to the education, research, advocacy, and the care of athletes of all ages. And we are physicians who combine our fellowship training in sports medicine with our primary specialty. So for example, my primary specialty is family medicine, uh, but Amos SM members can also have a primary specialty in internal medicine, pediatrics, emergency medicine, or physiatry. And then we go on to do a fellowship in 
sports medicine. By the nature of our training and our experience, we as primary care sports medicine physicians are ideally suited to provide comprehensive medical care for athletes, sports teams, or active individuals who are simply looking to maintain a healthy lifestyle. So this is what we do and this is what our training is. Because uh, we are board certified in a primary care specialty, we as primary care sports medicine physicians also will counsel patients on nutrition, hydration, sleep, and mental health when discussing exercise and sports because these all fit in um, are very important factors in terms of being able to um, exercise and be able to perform your sport or your triathlon or your half marathon or your 5K uh, or your, your, you know, your cycling on the weekends um, and be successful doing it. And these are some of the a talk that I gave, a national talk I gave, and, and one of the papers that we recently had published uh, about mental health issues in athletes. Almost 30 years of, of being a, a sports medicine physician. You know, part of my leadership roles um, and some of the clinical roles that I've had is to uh, really try to um, bring forth such initiatives as exercise as medicine, um, how healthy it is to uh, for mental health um, and physical health to be active. Um, these are um, some examples of the patients that I take care of, the youth athletes that I take care of, as well as recreational athletes, um, collegiate athletes, masters athletes, athletes with um, who are differently abled, our elite um, athletes as well. Since 2015, um, I have been a clinical professor at UCSF in the departments of orthopedics and family community medicine. And um, I am the fellowship program director for primary care sports medicine. And I would say one of the most fun uh, things that I've done uh, since that is I was able to take our fellow um, who family medicine trained and doing their fellowship in sports medicine. This is Dr. Ginger Cupid, who recently joined our faculty. Um, and we were in the Wubble for a whole month down in Florida uh, as they opened up their season. Um, it, and this was in um, July of 2020. And there um, she met her childhood heroes there in Florida. And then um, this year, I we have another fellow, Dr. Pete Young. Um, this is one of, uh, my patients who won a silver in Tokyo, uh, one of our decorated swimmers. I, I don't have the picture of him wearing the silver medal around his neck. Uh, that was really a cool experience for him. But um, we currently are down in Pismo Beach. We're at the uh, ISA, the International Surfing Association's World Para Championships in Surfing. And this is one of the competitors. And you can see below the knee amputee who's kneeling while surfing. Um, this is quite incredible, um, these athletes that are down here and we're providing medical care for them. So as we close, um, I wanna talk about what is your motivation to exercise? What is your inspiration? What is your passion? What is your motivation? Do you wanna lose that COVID-15? You know, um, gyms were closed, your normal routine was thrown off and you gain 15 pounds, you know? Is that your motivation to exercise now? Do you wanna get off some of the medications you're on for your high blood pressure, uh, for your high blood sugars? Um, do you wanna live longer? Do you wanna see potential grandchildren? Do you wanna avoid a knee replacement for as long as possible? Do you wanna remain living independently as long as you can? Do you wanna decrease your risk of falling and fracturing a bone? You saw it happen in one of your parents. You'd like to decrease that risk for yourself. Do you want to improve your cognition, decrease your risk of dementia? Do you want to keep beating your partner at Jeopardy um, when you play in the evenings? Um, you know, what's your passion? Do you love to dance like my 92-year-old mother? Um, um, you know, who's your inspiration? I mean, do you, did you pick up tennis? You know, a lot of people picked up tennis. They picked up golf um, like I did during COVID. Um, you know, those were two sports. Another sport was uh, surfing. Surfing was big. You could be outside. Um, uh, you, your risk of transmission of COVID outside was, was very low. Um, I want to introduce you um, uh, to Dana. Dana is a former uh, Marine. He lost his leg while overseas fighting for our country. He ballooned up to 300 pounds, 300 pounds. Um, he said that he uh, turned on the show um, 
my 600 pound life. I believe that's the title of it. And um, he watched it and he said, I'm heading that way. And after a couple of days, he began a diet and exercise program. He cut out refined sugars. He cut out carbs, simple carbs. He cut out alcohol and uh, he began to surf. And he is now 170 pounds. He is a surfer and uh, it is a beautiful sport for him and uh, one that he can do lifelong, lifelong. And he's in his 50s. The last point I want to make is about shared decision making. This is a very important topic that, that we have with our patients. It is a key component of patient centered healthcare. And shared decision making is a process where where we work with our patients. We work together to make decisions, select tests, treatments, and care plans based on clinical evidence and also our experience. And what we do is we balance the risk and expected outcomes with your patient preferences and your values, okay? And even prescribing exercise involves shared decision-making. And so I wanna bring that up. I, I don't, uh, you know, if you decide that this is a step that you wanna make, um, and you want to talk to your uh, physician about it, um, I, I don't want you to be shy in, in telling your physician what is it is you're, you're wanting to accomplish, uh, what questions you have, um, et cetera, because it is a shared decision and, and you have to buy into it. You have to want to do it um, and you want to, have to, you want to be motivated um, because if you do too much, do too little, I mean, you, you want to be able to accomplish things um, and you want to feel empowered making those decisions, but you also want um, to be able to see gains. Um, and that will feed itself. It's a feedback loop that's going to want to make you exercise more and to be healthier. Thank you, Cindy. That was such a great talk. And I always enjoy hearing your perspective. Um, as a sports medicine specialist myself, this is near and dear to our heart. And, and I just think, um, you know, as doctors, we have the advantage of seeing so many people. We see you know, 50 patients a week. So over the year, you can imagine how many people we see. And it's always fascinating to me when you see people that are 70, 80, 90, that look 20 to 30 years younger. So that's the title of your talk, you know, and they all have the common thread that they exercise. It's so clear that it helps you age well. And obviously all the facts you presented today did that, but it, it's just, when you do this job for a while, you know, what we do, we see it every day in our practice. So it's inspiring to me. It makes me want to work out because I know that's how we become less sick. But anyway, I'm going to answer, I'm going to ask some questions to you that our panel, our panelists are, our, um, I'm sorry, our uh, patients and listeners out there have asked. So um, from an anonymous attendee, does doubles pickleball count as moderate activity? Uh, that is a yes. And it has exploded. Uh, that is one thing I forgot to say. I said tennis has exploded, so has pickleball as a as a activity. So yes, that would be yes. But again, again, if you don't get to the pickleball, and you that may not be moderate enough, right? And so when you're talking about, it's very individualized and in whether or not something is going to be a vigorous activity for you versus a moderate intensity activity. Um, and so I I would use the talk test. I believe um, if you're unsure, but in general. Um, it does count as a moderate activity. All right. Another question from Mr. Daniel Riley. Please speak about the relationship between exercise and blood pressure. If you have high pressure stage one, do you need to be careful about engaging in vigorous exercise? Dan, that is a great question. And so stage one, um, well, let me go to your first one. The relationship between exercise and blood pressure, we do know that your blood pressure will decrease after exercise. So after you have exercise, um, your body, your blood pressure will decrease. And those, so that's why those people who exercise can go off of their antihypertensive medications because it has the ability to decrease your uh, systolic blood pressure and your diastolic blood pressure. And so um, that is a, it is a positive relationship. Um, does that make sense? But it is a beneficial relationship. Um, and if you have stage one, you need to be careful about engaging in vigorous exercise. Again, I would start with, you know, I would hope that you're not going from not doing anything to starting vigorous exercise, that you're moving from a progressive stage of going from um, not being very active to the 
uh, light intensity to the moderate intensity and the vigorous. And then you can, if you're checking your blood pressure, you can check that at home uh, to be able to see uh, what has happened to your blood pressure as you start that exercise program. When we say you need to be careful, only from the perspective of not stressing your body too high um, for other other types of injuries and things that can happen. But no, the typically in a stage one, um, the, the care that you need to take is to be progressive with your um, exercise advancement. Um, but also um, I would imagine um, that you are um, doing some monitoring of the blood pressure as well. Great. But it is not you. a reason to get, you don't have to get screened if you have um, stage one uh, blood pressure, high blood pressure. All right. Could you ever regain lost muscle elasticity through stretching exercises? Yes. <laughs> yes, it's good. Okay. <laughs> Is swimming or water aerobics in an indoor public pool safe given COVID? Uh, okay. Very good question. Um, I am. Uh, so I am just going to say that we have to follow county health regulations. Um, so I'm never going to say anything that the county uh, may be uh, implementing. I, um, we have not found there to be, as far as I know, uh, transmissions from swimming or water aerobics. But on the other hand, most places closed um, and, and had not been opening until vaccinations were in place, right? Does this make sense? So, uh, and still there are indoor pools that have still not opened up yet um, uh, in some different uh, arenas. So I would say that as long as you are still distancing while you're in the water doing aerobics, um, that you are okay um, to be uh, swimming or doing water aerobics. Um, uh, certainly an outdoor pool, especially in California, if it's heated is safer. To be, to be in there. And even in, for those of you who are swimming outdoors, there are still regulations that are in place in terms of lane sharing. You cannot share a lane. Um, some pools are still keeping, you're not swimming adjacent to lane. There's a lane in between uh, what you're swimming in. So there are definitely still regulations being placed, but I will say that you have to follow county guidelines. Outdoor is still safer than indoor. Um, and uh, safe is a relative term. If someone is positive and they haven't reported, being positive, they're symptomatic and they go into an indoor public pool and they're symptomatic and they have to be swimming next to you, then it's not safe. So this is again, a public health issue and, and we need to be responsible for our most vulnerable and we need to be responsible for each other. I will comment. I can make a quick comment on that, but um, I, I live in the East Bay as well. And, um, and my children are very involved in swim programs and they were able to return very quickly outdoor swimming space lanes, just like Cindy has said. And our swim program is huge. I mean, over 380 children on the team and um, ranging in all ages. And there's been no transmissions, which is fascinating. We should probably write it up um, because it's really one of the larger cohorts of, of swimmers are out here in Arinda, Lafayette, Moraga area. And, and um, anyway, they think that Prob probably the chlorine, which is bleach, essentially mm -hmm. it's a form of bleach kills the virus, which is great. So anyway, we've had no transmissions on our team, which has been really great for my kids to continue that sport throughout the pandemic. Um, does the terrain of San Francisco help residents live longer by offering many aerobic moments walking uphill? Would you like to do a study with us, anonymous <laughs> attendee? That would be great. Um, I don't, I don't, know that other studies have been done, but certainly I would say yes. I mean, you're, you're, um, you're talking about this intensity, right? This kind of like this uh, high intensity interval uh, training um, by going uphill, um, you're getting your heart rate faster than if you're going on level ground. I don't know, but we do know that in Europe, we do know that in countries where they are taking public transportation, they are biking, they are taking the bus, they're taking the train, they're walking to the train, they're walking to the bus, and they were walking more, they have longer lifespans than we do. Now, we also have excess, we have the big gulp, we have the big fries, you know, we, we live in a, also a country of a lot of dietary excess. Um, and uh, perhaps that that's adding to our lower 
uh, average uh, rate or, or age that we live to. Um, but um, certainly, I would say um, those residents who are walking uphill, um, is it better than those who are walking on level ground? I would say that if they are prepared to walk uphill and they're not wearing the improper footwear and they don't have any cardiac symptoms <laughs> that would lead them to um, have uh, chest pain, et cetera, et cetera, then um, I would say it's a benefit. I cannot tell you with any evidence that they are living longer, however, but all arrows would point to the fact that um, they certainly could be. Okay. What is your view on the future of tackle football, especially school age <laughs> kids, or can it be made safer? Um, let's see. Well, this is, is this, um, this is not really the topic of this conversation. <laughs> and this is like a whole nother lecture. So there's a, there's one area of thought that um, um, football should be made um, non-tackle flag football until um, kids are in high school um, without any real evidence regarding what, why that would be safer if kids are 14 versus 13. Um, and I do think that it can be made safer with um, consistent implementation of rules. I do think that it can be, it has been made safer by eliminating um, the amount of tackle uh, practices during the week. Um, it has been made safer uh, with more education um, and more coaching education. Um, but is inherently tackle football risky? Riskier in terms of concussions, head and neck injuries? Uh, yes, because of the virtue of the type of sport it is, right? Um, and it's very similar to, if you look at uh, epidemiological studies of rugby, um, of soccer, of ice hockey, of basketball, you know, I mean, there are certain injuries that are more, um, that are higher in, in those sports than in other sports. Um, I just had a conversation with someone earlier today about um, the future of football. And I um, can just say that um, we need to continue to do studies. We need to continue to investigate. We need to continue to make sure that we're protecting um, our children uh, from all. Um, we, we cannot prevent all injuries, but we can reduce the risk of injuries. Uh, and that's what our goal should be. Um, now, do we want to eliminate opportunities for kids to be able to play sports? No. Um, we don't, we wanna provide as many opportunities as we can for kids to be healthy and to play sports that they have a passion to want to play. Uh, because we have a obesity issue with our young people in our country. So we want them to stay active and team sports are a wonderful incentive to do well in school, to not get pregnant, to not use drugs, um, and to be healthier. And so as much as we can, we want to promote safe sport. Perfect. I love that. Um, for weightlifting, is it better to lift more weight and do less reps or less weight and more reps? It depends on what your goals are. So if you, um, want to, um, be stronger um, for certain reasons, then it is better to lift more weight and do less reps. If you uh, really uh, want to build tone and endurance uh, in your muscle, um, and um, you know it, the, your goal is not to be able to um, um, be able to push a sled further or to lift more weights. Um, then um, less weight and more reps uh, is the way to go. And you can also actually uh, burn fat um, um, with weightlifting as well, and, and both ways. Okay, um, this is a good question. We're lucky to have nearby beaches to walk on, but the experience is often uncomfortable. Is that because it's not natural? Do you recommend powering through um, it as it does have benefits? Hmm. So the experience can be uncomfortable because if the 
beach is slanted, then it is very uncomfortable to walk for your ankles and feet to walk on a beach that's slanted as it's slanting like going towards the ocean. Um, and oftentimes you wanna find a part of the beach that's flat as possible. Um, and oftentimes you wanna wear shoes. So if you can walk on hard packed uh, beach like here at Pismo Beach, it's you know with the tide being out, it's a hard packed sand and, um, and wearing your tennis shoes where you're supportive. Um, Oftentimes people love, they go to the beach and they want to be barefoot and they want to feel the sand between their toes. But the problem is they don't have that uh, strength in their intrinsic foot muscles uh, to be able to walk comfortably on the beach and they end up straining a tendon or, or you know, hurting their heel or getting plantar fasciitis, et cetera. Um, the other thing is sometimes the sand is really soft. And so you're struggling to walk in the sand, that sand is soft and you're digging into it and it's very hard to get traction and you're kind of slipping and sliding and that can create injury as well and cause discomfort. So um, I do not recommend powering through it if you are uncomfortable walking in the sand or it's hurting. I would not recommend that you power through it. Okay, uh, this question, is it safe to do indoor exercise classes at a gym? I imagine in relation to COVID is what that question means. Yeah, I mean, it's the same thing. It, it, it is uh, safe. Uh, I, I would not, but um, that's primarily because we still have um, unknowns, right? We still have people who, uh, so we, let's, say, let's say in the ideal situation, you have um, your gym is checking vaccination cards but we do know there's breakthrough cases that people, even though they're vaccinated um, and even though they've had the booster, they can still get some breakthrough infections that are mild. So do you consider um, getting COVID but having mild symptoms being safe or do you not wanna get COVID at all? And some gyms, as you know, will check vaccine cards and they say you still need to be masked, but you all know as well as I do that if someone is not wearing a mask while they're running on the treadmill, um, a couple of treadmills over, are you going to be the one that says, hey, pull up your mask? And and believe me, I've had plenty of confrontations with people, um, not confrontations, discussions, we'll say, discussions with people about it. Um, so, uh, you know, as much as you can, I would, if you need to go to the gym or you really desire that um, social aspect or that motivation or your personal trainer is there, try to find times where it's emptier, all right, if you can. So early in the morning, um, or later in the evening, or uh, those times, talk to the gym manager, et cetera, and find out when there's, um, what they have. Do they have a, a filtering system? Are they able to open windows? Are they able to use fans uh, for circulation in there? And then weigh your risks yourself in terms of, um, do you wanna go ahead and double mask? Do you wanna go ahead and wear a, a, a cloth mask that's got a filter? Uh, are there things that you can do to protect yourself. If you feel relatively comfortable and you feel that the gym is small enough or the people know each other well and they're respectful enough of each other that you're safe, then 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 you're safe. Uh, you know, this is, it's not our determination for you to determine whether or not you feel that's safe, um, if that makes sense. You know, if the gym is open, the public health department is allowed it to be open with certain regulations, then in the end, it's your decision to make whether or not uh, that's a comfortable environment for you with all those parameters. True story. I mean, Dr. Chang knows this, but I am in COVID recovery right now. I recently had it about two and a half weeks ago. And the person who gave it to me was using a fake vaccine card in the Bay Area to go to the gym every day. So I know that there are, and I, I always think, I wonder how many people she gave it to at her gym. And do they even have a clue where they got it? So we know there are bad apples out there that are not vaccinated that are going and pretending to be. Last question. Do you have any recommendations for weight bearing exercises or websites to help strengthen bones? Well, uh, some of the ones that I, I mentioned um, have the weight bearing. So was, these weight bearing exercises, uh, and they don't have to be like even just um, walking is weight bearing, right? We know that walking is better for the bones than cycling. Um, in terms of building body, uh, building bone mass. So, um, and, and even just sidestepping. 
So if you have um, some three pound weights in your hand and you're gonna be doing some um, exercise, so you wanna do some weight training and you're doing, and you've got those three pound weights in your hands to do some strength training in your upper extremity, then you can actually do sidestepping up onto a stool and back down, up on a stool and back down and then front stepping. And that is a weight bearing exercise that will help strengthen your bone. You don't have to skip rope, right? You don't have to do plyometrics to strengthen your bone. Just the simple walking, um, that fast paced walking in the house is a strengthening exercise. You know, if you're doing modified push ups, right? So here I am in my hotel room, but if you're doing modified push ups where you are, hands are on a desk, you can do a modified push up where you're coming down and back up right? That is a loading on your upper extremity. If you want to do that, that will be loading on your upper extremity, but that's a modified weight bearing for the upper extremity as well. So there's definitely things that you can do. Um, and, um, but yeah, some of those sites have some of those exercises that you can do, especially the one um, that I talked about um, that had some of the exercises for the, um, uh, the seniors as well. Well, thank you. Um, I re really want to thank you, um, Cindy Chang, for being our speaker today and enlightening us about all the benefits of exercise. I want to thank all of the participants who submitted their questions and who listened to our lectures. Um, and it's been such a pleasure to conclude the mini med school season with Dr. Cindy Chang. So thank you all. <laughs>